Hi darlings, in this video we're going to draw something called Lewis dot structures. So what you'll need are your notes or pen and paper will do, your periodic table, and tables S and E from the New York State reference tables. So we'll do a quick review on atomic structures and how you draw atomic structures. So we're going to draw a calcium atom and what I have for you in the background is a clock image just to remind you where the electrons go in an atom. The first thing we have to do is find calcium on the periodic table. So it's located in group 2 and period 4. The next thing we'll do is go ahead and draw in the nucleus. So our protons and neutrons live in the nucleus and we can determine the number of protons based upon the number of, uh, uh, the atomic number, excuse me. And then from the atomic number, we can subtract that from the mass number, or in this case, the atomic mass listed right there, and get the number of neutrons. So that's in the center of our atom. Next, we fill in how many shells we have. So we can determine the number of shells based solely on the um, period number that it's in, or you can use the electron configuration listed on the lower left-hand corner of your table and determine how many shells you'll need. So since calcium's in period four, we'll need four shells. So we know that two electrons will fit into the first shell. We we'll drop them off at 12 o'clock. In the next shell, we can fit eight electrons. So we put them in 12, 3, 6, and 9, and then drop another one off in each spot. Do the same thing for the third shell. So at 12, 3, 6, and 9. And then the last shell has only two valence electrons. So we'll drop them off at 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock. So what Lewis dot diagrams are, just show, they just show the valence electrons and the symbol. So in this video, we will go over how to draw the Lewis dot diagrams for atoms, for covalent compounds, for ions, polyatomic ions, and ionic compounds. So we'll come back to calcium. We still have the clock face there for you, and we know that calcium, its symbol is Ca, and it has two valence electrons. We know it has two valence electrons because it's in group two. And we also know that because are based upon the electron configuration in the lower left hand corner. So we go ahead, just like we would for the valence shell, and drop off the two electrons for calcium. All right. So next we'll do the same thing for oxygen. Find oxygen on your periodic table. It's located in period two and group sixteen. And of course its symbol is O, so we'll put that right into the center. And since oxygen's in group 16, we say that it has six valence electrons. So we'll drop off the electrons just like we did, 12 o'clock, 3, 6, and 9, and then another two, a one at 12 o'clock and the other at 3 o'clock. So this gives us two open spots in oxygen. We also say that oxygen has something called lone pairs, meaning that those two electrons are sitting by themselves. They're not attached to anything else. So we have a lone pair here and then a lone pair there. We then show that we have unpaired electrons, so they just haven't matched up or been shared with any other um, elements yet. Okay. So go ahead and pause, do the aluminum atom, and then come on back. So aluminum is in group 13, so it should have three valence electrons, and each of their three valence electrons are going to be unpaired. Now go ahead and do phosphorus. Phosphorus is located in group 15 so it should have five valence electrons. And go ahead and label the uh, lone pairs and the unbonded pairs. So here we have a lone pair of electrons and then the other three are unpaired electrons. There are available sites to be shared with other uh, nonmetals, or when we move on to ionic compounds, they can be uh, there are spots where the metals electrons can be transferred in. Now we'll go ahead and start drawing covalent compounds. So remember, covalent compounds are uh, compounds between two nonmetals, and those electrons are being shared. So to make sure that we have the right number of valence electrons or electrons in each diagram. We count up how many valence electrons each atom has. So carbon, look up carbon on the periodic table, should be in group 14. So carbon has four valence electrons. 
and then we add up how many hydrogen should have. So there's four hydrogens, and hydrogen each has one balanced electron. So when we take four plus four times one, we should have eight electrons or eight dots all around our atom at the end. So let's go ahead and continue. Carbon has four balanced electrons. We've gone ahead and drawn those in. And we know we have to have four hydrogens. Hydrogen can only have one bond, so we'll show them each of their spots. So we have hydrogen there, and it's another hydrogen, the third hydrogen, and the fourth hydrogen. So we know we should have a total of eight electrons, or eight dots, and we do. So go ahead and count them up, make sure we have them. And we also want to make sure that we follow the octet rule. So that means that anything after period two, um, pretty much anything after carbon should have eight electrons or in its outer shell. So we'll cover up the hydrogens, just to make it a little bit more obvious for you. If you count them up, yep, carbon does have eight electrons, so it does fulfill the So we want to make sure that we know where the electrons are, what type of electrons there are. Since there are no lonely electrons, there's no lone pairs. And since we've created a compound, there should be no unbonded pairs. So each of these should end up being bonded pairs of electrons. So we have the black ones from carbon, and then in this case, the red ones from hydrogen. So these are all bonded pairs of electrons. Next, we have water. So let's count up the number of electrons we should have. There's two hydrogens, and each hydrogen has one valence electron. So it's going to be two times one, plus oxygen, which should have six electrons. And then we'll have a total of eight electrons, or eight dots, for today. So go ahead and draw the oxygen, which is um, shown here. Then we'll fill in the hydrogens. Okay. So we'll count them up again. We'll make sure that there's eight dots around. And we'll make sure that oxygen's fulfilling the octet rule. I'll cover up hydrogen, count up the number of electrons, and oxygen should have eight. So it does fulfill the octet rule. Then we'll label the lone pairs and bonded pairs. So go ahead and do that. We see here that water has two lone pairs of electrons and two bonded pairs of electrons. Now we'll do carbon dioxide. And this one's a little trickier. Uh, when, and pretty much a basic hint is if you only have one atom of an element, put that in the center unless it's hydrogen. So since we only have one carbon that has four balanced electrons, oops, and oxygen has six balanced electrons, go ahead and add them up. So we should have a total of 16 electrons. So we went ahead and put in oxygen, put in one carbon, and then the other oxygen. So we notice here that we actually have a bond here and a bond there. However, they're still unbonded electrons. So we need to do something. We need to make sure that they, those electrons do end up bonding. So what we'll do is actually bond the uh, one of the lone or unbonded electrons from oxygen to carbon, and then do the same thing with the other oxygen and carbon. So we end up forming something called a double bond. Now you'll notice that we've actually placed the electrons away from 12, 3, 6, and 9. As long as you have the right number of electrons um, around each atom, you're okay. Uh, you will see that it is a little different. And you've noticed that I've actually angled these oxygens, or excuse me, these electrons away. Um, and you'll see later on when we go into molecular geometry why we did that. Now here we see that we actually have more than two electrons uh, shared between a carbon and an oxygen. In fact, we have four. So we show that, the that there's a double bond. There's four shared electrons. So carbon and oxygen share a total of four electrons and that is a double bond. So we'll show the Lewis dot structure mixed in with the structural formula. And we actually see that these two electrons, we'll go back, 
that these four electrons, excuse me, end up being two bonds or a double bond. The same thing here. If you need to cover up oxygen just to make sure that you have or that carbon has an octet or fulfills the octet, and then after that cover up the carbon to make sure that each oxygen fulfills the octet rule. So we've done a single bond and a double bond. Nitrogen's a little unique. Nitrogen can actually form a triple bond. So we'll see that if we put two nitrogens together, we have a bond here, but then we also have some unbonded electrons. So just like with the carbon and the oxygen from before, we'll actually end up sharing those electrons as well. So this looks a little different, but we end up sharing three, or one nitrogen gives up or shares three electrons, the other nitrogen shares three electrons. So if you cover up each nitrogen, you should show that they have a total of eight balanced electrons to fulfill the octet rule. And to show that there are bonded electrons, or that those bonded electrons are there, we want to remind ourselves that there's six shared electrons, and that's a triple bond. So when we show the structural formula, we actually end up showing three lines. Each line represents two electrons, or a pair of electrons. So nitrogen can, have, can share six electrons, or three pairs of electrons. Now we'll switch over to ions and show Lewis dot diagrams of these ions. We've done the calcium atom. We know that there are two balanced electrons. And with the ion, well, calcium is a metal, so it's going to lose its electrons or transfer its electrons to a nonmetal. And calcium has a plus two charge, meaning that it's going to lose two electrons. Remember, electrons are negative. If they lose electrons, they end up being positive. So we're going to show what ends up happening in period four. Well, since calcium loses two electrons, there ends up being zero electrons around the calcium for the ion. Um, to show that this is not a fluke, that we didn't screw up or mess up, we actually end up showing brackets around the calcium and then display its charge on the outside of it. So the calcium ion is Ca with brackets around and a plus two superscripted just to show the charge. Now we'll do oxygen. Oxygen's in group 16. It can gain two electrons. And when it gains two electrons, we end up showing the oxygen ion. So you notice the black ones are the original ones from the oxygen. The maroon ones, or the red ones, are ones that have been transferred or given or shared with oxygen. Now, to show that this isn't normally, um, that oxygen doesn't normally have eight balanced electrons, just like with the other ion, or with calcium, we put brackets around it and the charge. So since we gained two electrons, we gained two negative charges, we actually end up having a negative two charge. Go ahead and do aluminum on your own. So pause me, draw out aluminum, and then come on back. So when we show aluminum, we show that there's zero electrons in that outermost shell, and that we have brackets around to show that it's an ion, and it's a plus three charge. I'm showing you the phosphorus atom here. Go ahead and draw the phosphorus ion. So pause me again, fill in the electrons, and show the ion. So we see here that phosphorus can gain three electrons. So we end up showing that it's a P with eight electrons around, the brackets to show the ion, and the minus three to show the charge. And just to remind ourselves that phosphorus does end up having minus three, excuse me, sorry. Uh, it has a minus three charge right there, and it's also in group 15, so it has three more spots to get to a noble gas configuration. So now we're going to do the polyatomic ions. Uh, these are in table E, and we should have memorized these by now, but in case we need to remind ourselves, use table E to help you. Um, so go ahead and write out what hydroxide is, or the formula of hydroxide. We should have that it's OH minus. Now let's count up the number of electrons, make sure that we have the right amount. 
So oxygen should have six electrons. Hydrogen has one. Plus, it's a negative charge, so actually to show that there's another electron there. So it's going to have a total of eight electrons. We still need to show that negative sign since it's still an ion. So we should be writing or drawing eight dots around the atoms today. All right, so here's oxygen. Here's the one that's shared with hydrogen. So we have let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven electrons. We need to make sure that we have eight. And that eight comes from that negative charge right there. So we draw on that next electron. And since it's an ion, we put brackets around it, and it's a minus one. Now that leads us to ionic compounds. We have calcium oxide right here. Here, um, its formula is CaO, one calcium, one oxygen. So we'll show the oxygen. We'll show the calcium. And since it's an ionic compound, those electrons are transferred from the metal to the nonmetal, in this case, from the calcium to the oxygen. So we show one electron going from the calcium to the oxygen there, and then another one. And since it's ionic compounds, we form ions, so we have to make sure that we draw the ions after. So we'll show each of the atoms, or excuse me, each of the ions. We'll fill in the number of valence electrons. Calcium is a ion with a plus two charge. Oxygen is an ion with a minus two charge. And since it's a uh, charge is balance out. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. That's why we have one calcium and one oxygen. So magnesium fluoride. Go ahead and write down what the formula for magnesium fluoride is. We should have MgF2. And if you don't remember why, Mg, oops, go back. Mg is in group two. It's a plus two charge. Fluorine is in group 17, it's a minus 1 charge, and we crisscross the numbers. So we have Mg and F2. So draw our two fluorines. And here's why there's two fluorines per one magnesium. Magnesium has two valence electrons, but fluorine only has one spot available. So that magnesium will donate one of the electrons to one fluorine and another electron to another fluorine. So magnesium has a plus two charge and we show fluorines on either side. Each one of them have gained an electron and is now a minus one charge. So we show that we only have one magnesium and two fluorines. All right, to summarize, Lewis dot diagrams show the valence electrons of atoms and ions. We need to make sure that we add up the number of valence electrons and spread them out appro appropriately. This is really key when it comes to those polyatomic ions in table E. Uh, we need to remind ourselves that covalent bonds share electrons. If we have two electrons being shared, that's a single bond. Four electrons being shared is a double bond. And six electrons being shared, that's a triple bond. And we need to remind ourselves that ions will have brackets with charges on the outside, superscripted. Um, and that's how we know that it's an ion that that electron, or excuse me, that, that ion has either gained or lost electrons. So hopefully that you guys got all this. Remember, you can always rewind, um, pause wherever you need to, go back through, especially if I've lost you or if I've gone too fast. And I will see you in class. Take care and have a great day.